Welcome, everyone. Um, we usually start about five minutes after the hour. Let me go ahead and stick the link in the chat so people can go and record their attendance there. If you could add yourself to the attendee list, that would be fantastic. <clears throat> and then um, do be aware that these calls are recorded and will be posted up to YouTube. Also, feel free to go ahead and add things to the um, agenda. Uh, we run a pretty open agenda. Most of the stuff we have on there currently is actually sort of our stock stuff. It doesn't take very long to get through. Okay, hello. We'll give it a few more minutes and then we'll get started. Sounds great. Okay, so two, uh, two things. Can somebody post the meeting notes and can somebody share the meeting notes?
Okay, let's go. Let's get started. So, welcome to the next Network Service Mesh meeting. We have this particular uh, meeting every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific. We also have a um, we also have an Asia friendly uh, meeting, which uh, occurs, I believe, at 3 a.m. Pacific time every other week. And we should have had one this week, so the next one should be in two weeks. We also participate in the CNCF Telecom User Group, which occurs every first Monday at 8 a.m. Pacific and every third Monday at 3 a.m. Pacific. The next call uh, will be on the first Monday of next month. We also participate in the CNCF SIG Network, which occurs every first and third Thursday of the month at 11 a.m. Pacific. We um, so we have a couple of major events coming up. Uh, we have Introduction to Network Service Mesh by the Cloud Native Austin Meetup, which is occurring on the 20th, on Thursday. We have March 18th in the Go San Francisco Meetup, a Cloud Native Zero Trust, uh, which I will be delivering. We have KubeCon Cloud Native Con Europe coming up uh, in March 30th through April 2nd, which We'll be at the REI Amsterdam. Um, the schedule has been announced. Uh, we also have NSMCon coming up. The CFP for that it closed on February 14th, and we will have the schedule out uh, shortly. There are still some sponsorship uh, opportunities available, so please uh, consider sponsoring if uh, if you have the ability to or if you're able to influence somebody to do so. We also have Open Networking and Edge Summit in North America, Los Angeles. The CFP for that is already closed. The schedule will be announced early next month. And that will occur April 20 through 21st. We have KubeCon, Cloud Native Con China. The CFP will close February 21st and the uh, uh, at 1159 Pacific time. CFP notifications will be out on May 11th and the schedule will be announced uh, shortly after. And we have ONES uh, where on September 29th, 30th, uh, ONES Europe, uh, the CFP will close on June 7th and schedule announced shortly afterwards. Uh, we have KubeCon and Cloud Native Con North America. This, the CFPs for that will open on April 22nd and close on June 12th. Um, and so very, the, we should also be having a NSM Con at that particular time as well, but nothing is announced yet. So make sure you keep that, uh, you keep that in mind. And a couple announcements. So we had, um, so we can move the agenda item at the very top, quick operator on, uh, quick update on NSM operator uh, down into the main agenda, that'll be good. Um, and as a reminder, we have a new project page. So if you're looking for things to do or wanna see what's going on, the project page is very informative. With that, do we have anyone from the social media community team on? Yes, I am on the call. Hi, everybody. Um, so it's been a busy week as far as social media goes. Um, now that the KubeCon schedule has been announced and it was the deadline for NSMCon CFPs last week, Friday, it was really busy. With that being said, we gained 11 followers on Twitter, followed four accounts, and had a total of 34 tweets and retweets. Um, as mentioned, a lot of that was CFP deadline reminders. There was a tweet that went out um, trying to gather some people to sponsor NSMCon, as well as a tweet for thanking everyone that did submit CFPs. And um, with in that same tweet just announcing that the schedule will be out on Friday. There were also individual tweets per um, 
network service mesh sessions that will be presented at KubeCon. There were some general call reminders, meeting recap videos that went out, some CNCF news as far as the weekly webinars that were happening last week and some events coming up, OSS in Austin and ONES in LA. And um, also tweeted about the Cloud Native Meetup happening in Austin this week. So that also get um, some more attention over the next few days just to further promote that and get as many people to attend that as possible. And just some general retweets about um, open source, service mesh, um, et cetera. And then LinkedIn, again, we are back to gaining 10 followers this last week. So that was exciting to see. And we um, posted the same, the same content on Twitter, I'm sorry, on LinkedIn as the original content that went out on Twitter. So Twitter, we are at 696 followers. So hopefully within the next few days, we will reach the next goal of 700 followers. And we will just continue to promote um, as we have been in SMCon related, QCon related events and anything else that comes up. So that's it for me. Thank you. That, that is awesome. We do appreciate all that you do. Um, I, I know for me personally, and I suspect this is true for a lot of the other folks who um, are involved with the project, all of the social media stuff is black magic and you guys make it look so easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it is much appreciated. You're welcome. Cool. Awesome. <clears throat> so, I think um, there was a uh, update on the Asia call. Um, did someone who was there give us a uh, rundown and uh, pass on any questions? Mm, it was just a uh, few of persons, Nikolai and uh, Zarek team, but mostly no, nothing uh, and nobody from uh, Real Asia. So we just have some. Uh, pull request and SDK, a bit of discussions. Yeah, yeah, we were more, mostly just uh, using the time to uh, talk developer stuff. <laughs> and yeah, the, there were a couple of topics which uh, we discussed, so here they are. <clears throat> um, So is there anything, uh, is, is there anything that, that you all think you, uh, need some action in this, uh, in this meeting or is, are you all good at this time? Uh, no, not, nothing really. At least I don't think, I don't know, Andre? Uh, what's the question? Sorry, I missed it. Change the time. I was just asking if there was anything uh, that uh, if there was anything that popped up in the last meeting that would be better uh, answered with uh, with this particular group since we have a different audience. But it sounds like it might not be. Uh, yeah. It's... Cool. No worries. Um, we have uh, an update on the MSM operator. Um, let's see, there's no name on that, but I assume. Yeah, uh, it, it was me, uh, <laughs> Alexander <laughs> from you're, Red Hat. You were the usual suspect for this topic, so yes. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I saw there was an Alexander on there, and it's like the last name looks different <laughs> than I saw yours. Okay. Okay, no problem, no problem. Yeah, uh, so hello everyone. Um, I'm, I'm actually uh, getting close to, to hit the PR uh, on both uh, what we call community uh, operators repo and the upstream community operators repo. Uh, with that, um, NSM operator will be kind of uh, shipped by default with Red Hat OpenShift. So, and also you can install it automatically using um, 
using the Operator Hub I.O. So uh, I'm almost there. I'm, I'm changing a few things. Uh, I should have documentation on that by the end of the week. And it will be really, really easy to install everything. So yeah, basically to say that the PR is, uh, is to come any day uh, in this week. And to say also that that animated GIF that you guys provided me, that thing gets giant when I try to convert it to base 64. So it makes <laughs> like a file. <laughs> yeah. I can, I can yeah. go and do that to whatever at this point. Um, so just ping me on Slack, um, you know, and, and we, we should be able to sort that out. And, and also let me know on Slack what size you would like it to be. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I don't know if it work will work on, on, on the Operator Hub, embedded Operator Hub inside OpenShift, because the, the, the icons are pretty small there. I, I, I don't know. I don't really know. I can even share my screen and show how, how it, it, it is. Do you want to see that? I, I think Just that would the, be amusing, if nothing else. Yeah. So Sorry. Optimize. Yeah, go for it. We think about. Uh, we we would have fun seeing it. Okay. Let let me let me try to share just a second. Uh, let me see. I have so okay. many desktops open here. <laughs> so okay. also give us uh, an idea as to how much we have to uh, slim it down as well. So. It's this one. Yeah. So basically, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, which one are you seeing? Uh, no, I don't know. Are you seeing OpenShift or? You're seeing uh, a web a web browser that says installed operators with an. Oh, okay, okay, cool, cool. So when you when you log into OpenShift, you 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 get this home page with dashboards and everything. If you go into operators uh, and go into Operator Hub, uh, you can see that we have this kind of App Store like experience where you have a lot of operators here installing by default many applications using the operator lifecycle manager. So now if I type NSM here, I find network service mesh operator. So mm -hmm. with that, see the icon is pretty small here. <laughs> if I try to put a giant thing, I, I don't know what is gonna happen, but it, it, it goes from 56 kilobytes to to 7.5 megabytes. So <laughs> you can if you can if you can give me a size, I can jump into whatever size you'd like. Um, okay, I, okay. I I'll, been, I'll try. I can try that. I had been thinking that you were dealing with sort of a, a web pagey thing, which will let you, you know, which web browsers yeah. will shrink it to whatever size. But give me, give me an icon size, and I'm sure someone has specified the icon size. And it's, it's, yeah, it's, there is. It's literally two minutes to go and export to that icon size. Yeah, I don't. I don't think this is the problem, though, because uh, we have like a, a YAML file, which is the cluster service version that we use to implement this this whole uh, infrastructure. And on that YAML file, we have what we call spec descriptors. With the spec descriptors, we are describing the fields that we have on under any operator. So for example, here, I would install uh, the service mesh operator just using this screen. We have some instructions, we have like repository, a lot of other information. It's already installed because I'm testing now. And uh, when I come into the install operators, I'll see the operator running and I can see the provided APIs here. So here, when I click in network service mesh, which is the one I want to like to implement and run, I, I can click create an NSM, then I see the file, but the X descriptors, what they do is something like this. I can transform this YAML into a, like a form, a web form. This is broken, by the way. This is why I am messing with that right now. This is why I'm not able to fully demo the installation here because some of those types are not exactly uh, accurate with uh, the code underneath. But uh, but yeah, like uh, those X descriptors and, and the images, they have a field inside with, I think it's PNG and GIF format. Uh, those two formats are the ones that will, uh, al will be allowed. So I don't know if I can put uh, an animated GIF there, but I can transform into base64, change it to PNG and try to deploy and see what happens. <laughs> And that's it. This is the final result what could, on, on, on what the could screen. What possibly go wrong? 
uh, <laughs> not running, maybe not running. I don't know. <laughs> or get too heavy, too slow. I don't know. I actually don't know. I need to test. I need to test. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, yeah but we'll the file. The that... file. Sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say we'll say it was optimized for uh, for 8K full screen. Uh, wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know what would happen. Uh, I, I just, uh, what I can say is that my uh, VS code with Base64 uh, converted image like that, it gets really, really slow. So just my VS code, is not, it's not like processing the image, but because it becomes a text file with 7.5 megabytes. So... That, that's my main concern. When I saw that, okay, it will be a little bit weird working with this file because I have content uh, above the image and below the image, and there is tons and tons and tons of base64 code. And right in the middle of the file, yeah, it's kind of hard to, to manage. But I can try, I can try. Uh, even, even people in my team, they, they were curious about it. They, they wanted to know well, what happens if we, if we put there because no <laughs> no other operator is trying to do that. <laughs> so, so among the many other firsts for network service mesh. Oh, well, let, let's try, let's try, let's try. But I, but first, I need to fix a few a few types on those fields and and finally run the the Ultimate uh, testing tool, the scorecards that will probably put me into a place where I need to to put this status field on the NSM object as a whole. So I'll, I'll put a very simple one uh, because to in order to, to be in OpenShift, I need a status field. It, it's the one that will say like when I have something installed, it will give me like, uh, let me bring it back. Things like here, uh, if it is it's succeeded, what status is happening. So, but not here in the operator. In, in the network self smash itself when I run this guy here. So that's it. Uh, we should be, uh, we should have a, a, a PR uh, really soon. That's my, my update for today. Nice. And um, so one thing that we would, uh, um, if, if and only if you are comfortable, um, it, once, uh, once all this stuff is, uh, is working, uh, we'd like to see about creating a new uh, repo for this stuff to live in the NSM uh, repository and sure. uh, setting it up so that uh, uh, you and a couple others can have uh, access to help us uh, to, to help us with it and also to have a place. Uh, we, one of the things that we will want to do is we'll want to make sure that this stuff also drives through, uh, through CI. And so um, that way that as we make changes that we find things that, uh, that break the operator and we can make sure that it gets fixed over time. So sure. Uh, uh, is, is this something you'd be interested in helping with? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I, 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 I would be glad to have just a fork. If you, if you put on, on under the NSM org, it's not a problem. Then we can transfer everything to there. That will be a little bit of a pain too, because uh, there is the go path. There are some things that I will need to change, but it will work. We can change everything and, and, and put there. And then I just need to fork. Uh, and that's, that's, that's enough. Uh, I think uh, I can contribute from, from there and put PRs there and have other, other people reviewing and everything. Uh, and it's cool. It's cool because we, if we can put uh, more people working on that, that's the goal. Yeah, that, that'd be fantastic. And so, uh, and that means that like we have resources from uh, 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 the CNCF and Packet and a few others um, who have been very generous in, in giving us resources to CI these type of things. And so I think this is a, uh, landing it in the, in the repo and then getting it, uh, getting those things wired in, I think is, uh, is of high value. So we'll, we'll start working uh, towards that. Sure, sure, no problem. I, I hope I hope next week, uh, if if I can, maybe even not having the PR, I think next week I may be able to 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 do a full a full demonstration on that. That will be cool. 
Cool. We definitely look forward to seeing it. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Sure. Our pleasure. Okay. So, uh, was there anything else on the or not on the agenda that uh, people would like to discuss? Um. Yep, there, there was this um, this thing that came up actually in our previous conversation, and um, I thought that it's probably good to <clears throat> to discuss it here, uh, also in front of the work group. And it's uh, more or less um, how are we um, moving, and what are the actual plans uh, with the this refactoring that is going on. I think that it's uh, worth that um, you know people hear about our plans and uh, where we are, what we. I mean, we went through the, the initial uh, presentation about the process, but maybe as a reminder uh, and kind of you know uh, intermediate report of what's going on. I guess it will be good to <clears throat> to discuss a little bit about this too. Um, do you, how, I don't know, how, how people feel about talking um, through this? Sure, sure. I, I apologize. I was briefly distracted by something. Um, mm -hmm. Could you reiterate? I think you were probably going to discuss about the, the refactoring stuff and timing. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like uh, where we are, um, how are we moving? Okay. Um, uh, shall I share the presentation that was, or? You, you want to share or how do you want to proceed here? Yeah, yeah, so totally. Um, the, the, you mean the, the presentation on what's on the repo pipeline and stuff or on the... Yes, uh, and I think it's like somehow, you know, interleaving at least, if not the same. Okay, give me, give me a second, hang on, let me, let me mm -hmm. get this up. Um, and we can sort of talk through what's going on there. One second. Google Docs is being slow today. Okay. All right, then let me go ahead and share. And I'll go through kind of fast. Do ask questions if you have them. Um, <clears throat> we've talked about this in the community before, but I, I'm very much against the notion that you know you should have to attain to the community call, or that if you miss a community call, people should. I, I I hate it when people are like, "Oh, we already discussed this." No, 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 no. We can keep discussing this, right? Um, so on the repo pipelining, th this is stuff that we sort of have already started undertaking. Um, so we we've got our Unirepo network service mesh network service mesh, and it's gotten to be kind of very large and complex. And the CI for the, the Unirepo is very long, which encourages uh, larger changes since it takes an hour and a half to run the CI. People try, don't do smaller things. Um, it also, I think, probably discourages contribution and it slows development velocity. Um, and, and if you go look at our DevStat reports and I can bring them up, you can sort of see that. And then when we originally put this deck together, um, I'd done sort of an initial proof of concept with some of this stuff. So, you had the Unirepo, it took about an hour and 20 minutes to run CI. And then you had um, a pipeline of repos where you had API, uh, which um, effectively we managed with GitHub Actions to be able to not only run CI on these, but to um, auto push PRs to update the downstreams. So API runs, takes about a minute and 20 seconds to run at CI. About 30 seconds later, a PR turns up in SDK basically to update it to where API currently is. That takes about a minute and 20 seconds to run it. CI, once you merge that, then about 30 seconds later, stuff pops up in SDK VPPH and SDK kernel, they can run their CI. And so the, 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 the total end to end, you know, not counting the human review time, ends up being very, very quick um, in all of this. And so it becomes very, very doable to go through and um, do rapid development. 
And so the proposal was that we go to a pipelining scheme sort of like this, where you know, API has the top level APIs, um, those get auto-propagated to SDK um, as PRs. SDK then can get auto-propagated to either various platform things like um, SDK VPP agent, SDK kernel, SDK SROV, whatever. Um, and those can all be propagated to a series of commands where each command repo builds a single Docker container for a command. Um, and actually, I just talked to some of this last slide. And then when things merge into the commands, they could then auto-propagate to update a repo with Helm charts or to update an operator repo, uh, which could then run their own CIs um, on those things. Um, but, but at the level of, C of Helm and operator, because when you're talking about integration tests, then you're talking about having per platform integration repos like integration dash K8 stash packet, integration dash K8 stash AWS that get fed off of integration tests. Um, in, you know, and, and so things propagate through the system. So the, I want to go and fix a bug in SDK that ends up being a very quick CI cycle that propagates through the system. Now you may discover that you have a problem downstream and so we do want to talk about failure detection and remediation. So um, one of the things that's actually true of this model is that it, it actually encourages stronger unit testing. But let's say that for the sake of argument, we merge a PR in SDK platform, um, and that propagates to SDK command. It passes, and it gets propagated to the Helm charts and the operators. They go up, and they hit the integration, and some platform has a failure. Um, you chase back the failure and you discover that actually it was this change in SDK um, that caused it. So you fix it in SDK, you add unit tests to make sure we don't have quite that failure or get an SDK. Um, the PR merge is fixed, it propagates to the system and integration gets a PR that actually can uh, be merged and come bring it up. Now please note at each step we can choose to only merge these things if and only if um, they actually are passing the local CI. And this has advantages in that it gives us a clean roadmap to introduce new platforms. You just start a new repo. Uh, it's got much faster CI experience for users, uh, biases towards catching things early rather than late. Um, and it allows for the formation of sub communities. So, you know, we've already got sort of some of this going on in an early form around the SROV stuff. Um, Alex, I think as soon as you can find friends, you could probably foment one around operator. Um, that sort of thing. Um, so that's the repo pipelining. Do folks have any questions on that? Is this sort of what you were looking for, Nikolai? Um, yes, 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 yes. Okay. And, and, and where we are right now is we're still getting the pieces put in place for API, SDK, SDK VPP agent, and SDK kernel. So we haven't quite gotten to the command yet, though I'm hopeful we'll get to our first commands this week. Um, so the other two things around refactors was we were talking about moving NSM forwarder to being just another cross-connect NSC. Mm -hmm. And this was sort of talking about the current state where we have the network service API, where you go through and you say, okay, I'd like to uh, make a request for the network service. Uh, or close the network service. We've got the registry API, but then we also have this cross-connect API and this forwarder registration API. And the cross-connect API is just bringing two, um, two connections together. And, and as we gained experience, we've realized that this makes things very complicated. Um, and, and so, you know, the current sequence diagram is essentially a client comes into the manager and makes a request. The manager makes a request to the network service endpoint, gets back its connection. It then sends a cross-connect request to the forwarder, gets that back, and that sends the connection back to the NSC. Um, one of the problems with this is that we've got no really good way for the forwarders to, um, to a priori, you know, indicate things like, no, I actually can't do that SRIOV VF for you, for example. Um, so the, the, the proposal of going forward was to keep the network service and registry APIs, um, have the sequence diagram basically run as a chain. So you go to the manager, the manager makes a request to the forwarder, 
By the way, these are color coded. So when colors match, that's a request and a return. The forwarder basically puts its mechanisms that it's willing to do for that particular connection into the network service request. That gets sent to the network service endpoint. Uh, network service endpoint responds with its selection. That gets sent back to the forwarder. The forwarder then, you know, basically having gotten the piece that goes towards the NSC, it will then make its selection of where it wants to send things. Um, you know, what it wants to drop in the NSC based on its preferences, and then it comes back. And so this, this has the advantages that it's a simplification. There are fewer APIs, and the forwarder just becomes another pass-through that offers cross-connect as a service. Um, it allows forwarders to do resource reservation. So if I get an incoming request, um, I can reserve the resource when that incoming request comes in. Um, then on the outgoing request, I can hold that resource uh, when I send an outgoing request to the service manager uh, network service manager. And then when the network service manager comes back and tells me what the far end NSE wants, I can assign or release that resource. Um, it also massively simplifies healing because instead of having a bunch of different things we have to do with a bunch of different timers, um, you know, it basically becomes what to do when the next hop in the chain goes down. Um, and so you also get no special cases for forwarder versus any other NSE, which means you can use common SDK elements for both. So if I'm writing a, you know, virtual router or I'm writing a, uh, you know, cross connect NSE as a forwarder, they're both going to use, for example, the mechanism SDK pieces that are in common. Um, multi multi forwarder simply becomes iterating through the local available forwarders. So you can have local forwarders specific to particular nodes. Um, they don't have to be a diamond set. This is particularly important for SRIOV, where one node may need a forwarder that can program the SRIOV NIC, um, and another node may not. Or one node may need one that can program the particular smart NIC that's particular to that node, and another one may not. And again, as I mentioned, you can use the same SDK for NSCs and forwarders. And I won't walk through the activity diagram. There's a link here in the slides to the activity diagram. Um, I will stick this link to the slides, though, into the chat for folks. Everybody OK so far? I, I feel like this is a little bit like a monologue right now. It's not a monologue, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So, it, it, but, but this is sort of just setting the stage. And then the path stuff, um, our healing is complex. As we refactor from the forward to cross connect NSC, we need to rethink the healing because the, the current healing with lots of timers is rooted in the cross connect API. And so, path emerges from this rethink. So, it essentially just says, well, we keep network service mesh, we've got network service mesh and connection in the API. So, the proposal is to keep network service mesh basically as it is and then introduce a path into the connection where the path is a list of path segments. And those path segments have tokens um, as well as the name of where you're passing through in the ID. And we're also looking at adding metrics to them. And so the, the net result of this is that um, you can authenticate at every step. You can authenticate the entire chain. Um, you can have policy about the entire chain. Um, and healing becomes very, very, very straightforward to do in a very localized way. Um, so I've got an example here on restart. So the client is talking to the endpoint. So the endpoint, and by the way, there's an activity diagram with the whole thing back here, but I, I don't want to spend all the time to walk through it. But the client talks to the endpoint. The endpoint, um, you know, let's say it's an existing connection, the endpoint restarts. So the endpoint restarts. Client, monitor client gets its uh, connection back, gets its initial state transfer, um, and discovers that a connection it believes it has isn't in the endpoint, so it simply re-requests it. It's fairly straightforward. Um, on the client restarting, um, so the client restarts, the endpoint still believes it has a connection. Um, each pass segment has an expiration timer on it. So when that passes, the endpoint basically says, okay, we're done. Uh, this also means, by the way, that clients are constantly refreshing themselves and refreshing their credentials and policy. So if, for example, that you decide to change your policy, worst case exposure for someone being in violation of that policy is the expiry timers. After that, you're, everything fixes itself up. Um, client restart um, ends up being 
I'm sorry, this is Network Service Manager Restart. Uh, so for Network Service Manager Restart, it ends up being much the same way. If your Network Service Manager restarts, your client discovers that it wants a connection that isn't there. It, it actually asks for the connection back, and since it's got the path, the Network Service Manager knows which forwarder to send it to. The forwarder may not even know that, that there's a problem yet, right? And it goes ahead and, and you know, sends its request back to the Network Service Manager, who sends it back to the NSC because again, that's in the path and you end up being healed. You could also get the case where the forwarder initiates the healing, um, but I suspect that would be less likely. And so advantages here are it ends up being a simplification because you've got a single behavioral flow everywhere. Uh, robust auto healing is a property of the system. So you can heal if all components, but the leaf client restart, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, we, we sometimes call this KS Gorilla. Um, healing only flows forwards, not backwards. This is actually really important because if you try and make it for, flow backwards, you get all kinds of crazy uh, proliferation of timers and timers are really hard to manage. So we try and keep timers very localized and simple. Um, and also healing is indistinguishable from refreshing your authentication token, right? So what you do routinely works. Um, and so if the question about healing becomes, well, does healing work? Well, we're doing this behavior all the time. Uh, it's also more secure. Connections expire unless they're refreshed. Uh, so if policy changes or authentication expires, then the connection goes away. Um, and then robustness. Connections do not get torn down unless they expire. So if the client goes away, um, well, the client could always come back. Um, and whenever they get around to coming back, we're happy to re-plumb them to where they need to be in the connection. And those are sort of the 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 pieces we've been talking about here. So you were asking sort of where we are with this, Nikolai? You're muted, uh, Nikolai. Yes, so. yes, yeah. Um, yes, I mean, uh, I think that, that probably it would be worth uh, talking uh, a little bit about how these things kind of chain into one another because it seems like we're moving all of them <laughs> at the same time. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, effectively, kind of what it, it, basically, if you move to forwarders, we have an extraordinarily complicated uh, healing mechanism right now that uses the cross-connect API. So you need a way to heal that is, um, doesn't require the cross-connect API. And it turns out that the path approach appears to be both robust and simple, um, which is good. Um, so moving the cross-connect to the forwarder stuff, you need the path piece. Um, and it turns out that the, all the mono repo problems that we discussed become even worse as you try and do this refactor because if it takes an hour and a half to run CI for every little thing, which is what it currently does, then you have sort of a serious problem. We've been wanting to break up the mono repo anyway. And that's kind of how these are interrelated. Does that make sense? Um, yes, but I mean like uh, what, what we're saying here is that at some point in time, we're going to have um, more or less all, all of these like merged against the main repo or at least whatever is left out of it <laughs> in the end? Well, I guess the question is, do we want to, uh, to continue having a large unit repo with long no. CI? Okay. Um, so, I mean, I guess we have stuff that continues to go on in the unit repo while we're making the transition mm -hmm. and that's still there and it's functional. And I think that's actually very, very good. Um, and while this stuff is coming up. But my guess is that we will eventually get to a point where um, the pieces are coming out of, you know, the commands are all coming out of their command repos. The integration testing is coming out of the integration testing repos, et cetera. Is my guess as to where we're gonna end up at the end of the day. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. and then the question is which day? <laughs> end of which day? <laughs> I know, I understand. I mean, I mean a, lot of, yeah, yeah. a lot of people are typing as fast as they can. I'm hoping to get yeah, yeah, yeah. and repos going this week. Um, and we're, we're getting good unit test coverage that's coming up in the SDK stuff right now. Um, we're starting to sort of test some of the pieces, which is good. Um, because that means when you land in command, you're much more likely to land with a functional thing. Perfect. Cool. Okay. Um, and one... So one question, uh, perhaps I missed this, uh, is uh, based on on how things are currently going, 
Um, is is there is it a you're either using the old stuff or the new stuff, or is there is there some form of uh, transition compatibility that's there where, like maybe I I write a new forwarder in the new SDK, uh, is is that easy at this point to integrate with the current uh, uh, monolithic repo NSM that's uh, that's there? Uh, no, because the monolithic repo is still using the cross connect API and the healing that was built for the cross-connect API. OK, that makes sense. Yeah. So I mean, it, it, it's, but it's not like we're saying, go stop everything. Because quite frankly, if you want to do a new forwarder, and we've had a couple of cases of this go by already, what you discover very quickly is you can learn a lot about the process um, poking at the monolithic repo. Um, and then we do have folks, and I see some of them have actually turned up now for the call, which is awesome who are looking, for example, at building the SROV forwarder stuff. Um, and, you know, that's, that's goodness. Um, and, you know, also migrating over and building a kernel forwarder. So that's basically kind of where we're at. Um, I mean, the part of the reason this, this came about was the realization that we have this thing that's working. We have ongoing work where people are doing things to learn how to do, like, for example, new forwarders. And there's no point in halting that learning process, you know, because it becomes fairly straightforward to come and bring that back over here. So for example, the way the SDK is written, if I wanted to write, say, a new mechanism, say a mechanism, I don't know, for WireGuard. Now, I'm going to have to have figured out a lot about how WireGuard works already. And I can do that either in the monolithic repo or in the new repo. But once I figured out how WireGuard works, all I have to do is write an SDK chain element for WireGuard and then drop it into the command repo. And suddenly I've got a forwarder that supports WireGuard. Does that make sense? Yeah, and the reason I ask uh, that particular question is uh, to set up the next thing. Um, one of the concerns that people may have is the, uh, is there was quite a bit of work put into maybe creating your uh, forwarder and NSM, and then doing the work to get it migrated into the SDK is, uh, you know, people may be thinking of it as like a similar quantity of, of effort, but a reality, and as, the, as well, one of the people who's reviewing most of the PRs coming in, uh, I can tell you it's it seems to be the exact opposite. So people are, are having a very easy time in actually implementing stuff in the new SDK. And I suspect that the shifting, like once we get the, like SROV works with monolithic and then getting that to work in SDK uh, is it, like, we've already, we've already done the, the, we'll already have done the hard work of getting it working. So first we already have that advantage. And the second thing is the new API is incredibly simple. Uh, and very easy to to test and keep modular. So, so I want to make sure that people's uh, fears are uh, uh, around this type of thing are uh, are reduced. And so, I know that it's not going to go away until you see it all work. But you know, definitely. Uh, but I, I definitely feel confident with the with the current uh, the current path. And so, I think. As we get more people wrapped up into SDK, we'll see a lot more momentum, uh, just just because of the, the simplicity of the of the APIs and and getting them wired in. Yeah, might be on mute if you're talking. Uh, no, you are not. That was a great explanation. Thanks. Cool. So, but I mean, the other thing that, that I did want to point out is part of this is also we've got people who want to build network service mesh into other platforms, right? Than just Kubernetes. And so, if you know, if we have these composable pieces that make it very, very easy to do, um, where you don't have to figure out ninety percent of everything in order to do it. That should, I, I'm hoping, make it much easier for people to build the pieces of things. I mean, so for example, one of the one of the things I'm providing in the SDK is a 
thing that, that simply says, okay, I want a new endpoint. Well, what do you pass to an endpoint, new endpoint? You pass its name and you pass the, the piece that's implementing the thing that's, that's actually the work your endpoint does. And so all the machinery around timing out, all the machinery around authentication and authorization, all of those things, those are not things you have to think about. You just have to think about the piece that is, what is it that my particular network service does? Cool. Anything else on this topic? Otherwise, I'm inclined to go back to the agenda. I think the agenda was pretty much open after this. Cool. Uh, do folks have questions, comments, um, opinions, all of which are welcome here? Well, if not, then we will yield back nine minutes of time. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. You all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Cheers. All right. Well.